Besides the appointed New Testament reading read earlier, our sermon is drawn from an alternate gospel reading, St. John chapter 16, verses 5 through 11. Jesus said, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Thus far the text, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus taught of the Holy Spirit and his work early on in his ministry in his encounter with Nicodemus a member of the strictest sect of the Jews, a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish High Council, the Sanhedrin, and consequently a ruler, and also one of the chief teachers of his people. Since it is the Holy Spirit who woos us and draws us to Jesus, apparently he had already been working on Nicodemus because Though he came to Jesus under cover of darkness by night for fear of his colleagues, he came bearing this testimony. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. God from God, as we profess in our creed. For no one can do these things that you do, signs signifying God unless God is with him. God with God and God with us, our Emmanuel. This relates to an incident St. John records and uh, interprets right before this. Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all people, knew how fickle was their faith in that it was mere fascination with the signs and not faith in the one they signify, not in Jesus as Messiah, the one who performed them. So it was that Jesus came right to the point with Nicodemus in directing him from the sign to who and what it signified in order to establish genuine faith, not confirm a superficial and passing fancy. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So dazzled are his eyes by the outstanding signs without this born-again nature. Now Jesus is getting somewhere. As Nicodemus grapples with Jesus' words, instead of fixating on the spectacular signs themselves, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus wrestles with the implications of Jesus' teaching. Jesus replied, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot see, much less enter, the kingdom of God. In order to see and enter the kingdom of God, you must be born anew, born of the Holy Spirit in holy baptism, and borne along by his word. Otherwise, you see and walk 
by the, by the flesh, since flesh is born of flesh. To the contrary, you must see and walk by the Spirit in the Spirit of God. For that which is Spirit is born of the Holy Spirit, and for that you must be born again after this fashion. On Pentecost Eve, which the church observed yesterday, one gospel lesson is the record of Jesus' words spoken one year earlier. On the last great day, the culmination of the Old Testament type of the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Booths. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Spirit has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Again, St. John interprets. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, not fully, because Jesus was not yet glorified not fully. On the final day of the Feast of Booths, then, this Old Testament foreshadowing of the day of Pentecost, Jesus points to its consummation in the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit and uh, indwelling of believers in the latter event, after his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension after he finished his work and returned to the Father. This is what Jesus meant when he said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. After his resurrection, in his own person, and after his ascension, and forever thereafter, by way of the Holy Spirit received by the church on the day of Pentecost, and by all Christians in holy baptism. On this occasion, promising his disciples the Holy Spirit, who would dwell with them and uh, be in them forever, Jesus had said, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. How else but by the Holy Spirit are we to carry forward the great commission laid on the apostles and the church at Jesus' commissioning and on us at our baptism by the Holy Spirit to disciple all nations even as we are discipled, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them in such wise as to guard, keep, and to ever hold fast as the good deposit of the faith everything our Lord has committed to us, the blessed hope of everlasting life in our Savior Jesus Christ. So much for Jesus' presence with his disciples. But what of his taking leave of them and, and their taking leave of their senses at uh, his exodus? Jesus addresses this topic in the gospel lesson from which this sermon is drawn for the day of Pentecost. But now I get, go away to him who sent me and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, namely his talk of the coming of the Holy Spirit at his departure, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. If I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus must first complete his task of redemption before the Holy Spirit 
can begin his task of applying the fruits thereof. And this is how our advocate does so. In sanctifying us, setting us apart from the world unto God for his service and to his glory and to his people's good, joining us with Jesus as bodily members, members of his church and of the family and household of God in holy baptism. When he has come, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and uh, you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Without the Holy Spirit's activity of convicting people, of breaking God's commandments and thereby sinning against him and being guilty before him and cut off from him by their sin, they cannot see this, let alone acknowledge it, because the source of their sin, the fact that they do not believe in God, blinds them. In prosecuting people for their unbelief and sin, their incurable blind spot, therefore, the Holy Spirit convicts them of unrighteousness in view of God's righteousness in Christ, imputed to justified sinners whom the Spirit has converted from unbelieving to believing through the gospel of forgiveness and salvation on account of Christ, obtained by faith in him, and who, though ashamed of themselves due to their sin, are nonetheless not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith, or those who are righteous by faith shall live. This, moreover, is the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Christ Jesus to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this is how. Whom God set forth to be the propitiation by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, that he might be just and uh, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Only God the Spirit who proceeds from God the Father and uh, God the Son can convict the sinner of his sin and unrighteousness and unbelief and convince him of God's righteousness in Christ through his bloody sacrifice on the cross, reckoned to justified sinners through faith because Jesus has gone back to his Father from whence he came. In other words, because his glorious resurrection and ascension or exaltation at his Father's right hand has placed God's seal of approval on his redemptive act. And because the ruler of this world, the devil, is judged and condemned. All this is begun on the day we commemorate today, the day of Pentecost the full outpouring and infilling of the Holy Spirit whose almighty and inscrutable presence and activity was signified by the rushing mighty wind from heaven that filled the whole house where the disciples were sitting, by the divided tongues as a fire that rested on each one, and by the tongue speaking as each began to speak with other tongues 
in other languages as they were filled with the Holy Spirit and as he gave them utterance that all who were present for that feast day might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, each in his own native language, be convicted and converted by the Holy Spirit, repent of their sin, believe in Jesus, and receive forgiveness from him and be saved. Here, dear friends, is an account of just how exuberantly the church once celebrated this blessed occurrence. In the Middle Ages, the church's celebration of Pentecost involved architecture, not just anthems. The custom of painting heavenly scenes on the great domed and vaulted ceilings of cathedrals served not only to inspire the devout with blessed visions, but it also disguised some discreet trapdoors. These small openings were drilled through the cathedral ceiling to the rooftop. During the worship service on Pentecost, some hardy members would be drafted to climb up on the roof. At the appropriate moment during the liturgy, they would release live doves through these holes. From out of the painted skies and clouds on the cathedral's ceiling, swooping, diving symbols of a vitally present Holy Spirit would descend toward the people below. At the same moment, the choir boys would break into a whooshing and drumming sound of a holy windstorm. Finally, as the doves were flying and the winds were rushing and the ceiling, ho the ceiling holes would once again be utilized as bushels upon bushels of rose petals were showered down upon the congregation. These red flickering bits of flowers symbolized the tongues of flame falling upon all that waited below in faith. The church called this opening to the sky a holy spirit hole. A holy spirit hole. Pretty dramatic, huh? Live doves darting through realistic skies and clouds signified the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The spectacle probably reminded the worshipers of this spirit's descent in the form of a dove upon Jesus at his baptism. The choir boys emitted a sound reminiscent of the raucous wind which came from heaven and filled the whole house where the disciples congregated on Pentecost Day. The bushels of bright flickering rose petals fell upon the faithful like the tongues of fire which lighted upon the faithful that first Pentecost. All these Special effects were cleverly staged from the cathedral roof by way of the Holy Spirit holes punched through the roof and ceiling. But no matter how dramatic the presentation, these likenesses merely represented the Holy Spirit's real presence and real activity whereby he is present and active in us through God's word and sacraments of holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are the true Holy Spirit holes through which he comes and convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And having convicted and converted us, applies the fruits of Christ's redemption in sanctifying us unto salvation and eternal life. Thanks be to the triune God for Pentecost and to God the Father and God the Son for the outpouring and indwelling of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Amen.